going to start in approximately two minutes. Okay, well, hello everyone. On behalf of the partners and consultants of Understanding Ag, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Tips for a Successful Grazing Season with Dr. Alan Williams. Before we get started, I would like to ask everyone to please put your electronic devices on mute so we don't interrupt the presentation. I will also ask that if you have any questions today, please feel free to ask them in the question and answer box on the Zoom meeting. With that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Alan Williams. And I had the good fortune of meeting Alan back in 2012, and I probably heard him give no less than 200 presentations, workshops, webinars since that time. And I can honestly say that there is no one more knowledgeable in regards to the pastured protein industry from soil all the way up through plants, through production of the livestock, on into the processing and distribution of pastured proteins. It's a, a real blessing to be able to work with him on a daily basis. And we're in for a treat tonight as he shares with us tips for a successful grazing season. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Alan. Well, thank you, Gabe. Appreciate that. And welcome to everyone this evening. Glad to have you join us. Uh, certainly hope that we will be able to say at least one or two things that will be very useful to you during this upcoming grazing season. Uh, obviously, we have people signed up that have varying levels of grazing skill. Some of you, I, I, I look through the names of a lot of people who registered. Some of you are outstanding grazers. You have a very high level of skill. There are others that are, you know, more towards the beginning of their, their journey. Uh, so I designed this webinar purposefully for a mixed audience, knowing that, that we would have a number of different people across the board. What we're going to do this evening, obviously it's a single webinar, we've got limited time, so there's only so much we can cover. But what we're going to do this evening is we're gonna talk about some of the key things that you can be thinking about and implementing to make sure that you have as successful a grazing season here in 2020 as possible. 
If you've heard us speak before, you've heard us talk quite a bit about this word here, adaptive stewardship. That's what we call the form of grazing that we ourselves practice, that we advocate, and that we teach. And both of those words are critically important. We'll be talking this evening about why your grazing needs to be adaptive. And it certainly needs to be a form of grazing that allows you to be a good steward of what we have been called to oversee and what we have been blessed with. So no matter what you're grazing, it doesn't matter the species of livestock. The practices and principles that we're gonna talk about tonight and the tips work basically across the board. And I know that many of you who have signed up are multi-species grazers, as are we ourselves. So I hope that you're gonna be able to glean some things that are gonna allow you to to understand how to work with any species. The very first thing that I'm gonna to touch on in just very briefly are the six soil health principles. Again, if you've ever been through one of our schools, an academy, one of our workshops, or you've heard us speak anywhere, you've heard us talk about the soil health principles. And I just wanna remind you that we need to be practicing these six principles at all times, no matter what kind of farming or ranching operation that we have. And they are minimize soil disturbance, keep the soil covered, keep it armored, increase diversity, keep living roots in the soil, integrate livestock, but most importantly in this sixth principle, is a principle that my partners and I added about a year or so ago because we felt very strongly that without this principle, none of the rest of it matters. And that is context. You must know and define your context. And this includes management, resources, your ecosystem, your environment, your philosophy, your spiritual life, the quality of life, your finances, your economics, all of it. All of that is wrapped into context. And once we understand context, then we can appropriately and adequately apply and practice the other five soul health principles. The first thing that I wanna to say to you tonight in having a successful grazing season for 2020 is protect the soil. It is that simple. And always protect your soil. One of the biggest mistakes that you can make is to create situations where you have bare ground. Your microbes are gonna suffer. Your soil microorganisms are gonna suffer. Your plants are gonna suffer. That are, that are trying to grow there, and your livestock are gonna suffer. The entire ecosystem is gonna suffer, including water infiltration rates and soil aggregate. So it's critically important to protect that soil, keep it armored always. We may not, we're, we're in spring for most of us now, and we may not be thinking that this is so important. But now is the time to start protecting your soil because it won't be long before we're going to turn off in many areas of the, of the U.S. and other parts of the world. We'll turn off hot and dry. And what we protect and what we build now matters significantly for what we're going to produce and how well we're going to feed our livestock as we go later into the grazing season. Now, as you're planning your grazing season, one of the key things that we always do is we hope for the best, but we prepare for the worst. So if you look on the left-hand 
side of the slide, those pictures there, uh, those are pictures of, of drought stricken pastures and rangeland. Uh, Alejandro Correa is on, and I know he'll recognize one of those pictures there from down in the state of Chihuahua. Uh, but on the right hand side, you know, that's the best. That's where we have good conditions. Things are growing vibrantly and are highly productive. The worst situation we can put ourselves in particularly in the springtime, and, and we're very, very susceptible to this. I see grazers, even grazers that have been grazing for decades, still make this mistake. They have a great spring, plenty of moisture, temperatures are just right, more grass than they can possibly eat, and they overgraze. They don't prepare for the worst. They don't think the worst is coming. And they stock and they graze for the best instead of the worst. So always consider what your worst scenario can be for that year, prepare for it, graze for it starting first thing in the spring. And if it comes, you'll be ready. If it doesn't come, that's wonderful you still have more than your livestock can possibly eat. And that's the best possible position that you can be in throughout the year. So I put these two slides up to again, reiterate preparation. This is in the state of Chihuahua, down in Mexico, Northern Mexico, two neighboring ranches, side-by-side -side ranches, they both receive the same six inches of rain during the rainy season in the summer. This was a couple of years ago that these pictures were taken. The picture in the top left-hand corner, this ranch was unprepared. And you can see how much the six inches of rain benefited them, hardly at all. As a matter of fact, if you look at the soil itself, you can easily tell exactly what happened. The soil is crusted and cracked even after that rain. So it was basically so devoid of biology and soil aggregate that as soon as any rain came, it crusted over and the soil or the rain, excuse me, ponded and pooled and then ran off. And you can even see evidence of erosion here with just six inches of rain. But if you look on the right hand side, that picture, again, direct neighboring ranch after the same six inches of rain. So we have stark contrast between one fence line and the other, prepared versus unprepared. So I wanna show you a couple of slides of what we do not want to happen this grazing season. This is conventional grazing. And you can see from these pictures that on the left-hand side, this pasture has been continuously or set stock grazed. The cattle have grubbed it down tight. They have very selectively grazed. You can see a lot of weed pressure coming in now, a lot of bare ground showing, and there's a lot of old oxidized cow patties, which are indicative of a significant lack of biological activity both in the soil and on the soil and above the soil. And then on the right hand side, you can see what happens with conventional grazing. We see this was a former cow path that through the course of three, just three years with significant rainfall eroded so severely that it created this gully. And then these two pictures also represent what can happen when we're unprepared, when we hope for the best, but we actually get the worst. Uh, the top picture again, you can see that these cattle are now heavily reliant because of the lack of growth in biology. They're heavily reliant on feed being trucked, hauled to them on a daily basis and fed to them. And again, the bottom right picture you can see a pasture that has been significantly overgrazed through set stock or continuous grazing. 
Now, I love Andre Voisson. <clears throat> he was a famous French biochemist and farmer, grazer. But what I really love about Voisson was that he was an incredible observationist. Now, Voisson died in 1963, but he left behind an incredible legacy of knowledge and of observations that are really vital to us yet today. And one of the key things that Voisson noted is that overgrazing has little to do with the number of animals that were grazing, but far more to do with the amount of time that plants are exposed to those animals in a grazing event. If animals remained in any one place too long or returned to it too soon, they overgraze certain plants. And as an example of this, one cow grazing on a 10 acre paddock all season can kill thousands of plants through overgrazing yet being understocked while a thousand cows can graze that same 10 acre paddock for a portion of a day at high stock density and will not kill a single plant. So what we really want to do is we wanna do the best job that we can of simulating nature, simulating what used to happen in many parts of both North America and other continents around the globe with the wild, ruminants that once roamed in the hundreds of millions across the earth. These wild ruminants not only were made up of their individual species, there were always many other species intermingled, and they were moved around by both the resources and the predator populations. We don't have the types of situations today in many parts of the world, and certainly not in the US, that we once had. So we have to be the arbiter today of simulating nature, of creating biomimicry and ecomimicry by the way that we move our domesticated livestock across the landscape. So I'm going to talk tonight about the three rules of adaptive stewardship. And again, for many of you on the webinar tonight, you've heard of these. I'm gonna reiterate them again. So you've either heard them or you've read them in, in some of our articles, but many of you are familiar with these. So we won't take a long time going through these, but they are the rule of compounding, the rule of diversity and the rule of disruption. And again, compounding, as you remember, happens always. There are never any singular effects or impacts, ever. We may think they are, but they're not. Everything that happens out there in nature, on your farms, on your ranches, with biology, produces a whole series of compounding and cascading effects. We cannot escape that. And these compounding and cascading effects are never neutral. They're always either positive or negative. Now, the good news is, is that our management decisions on a daily basis determine whether these compounding effects are going to be positive or negative and whether we're going to create good or bad cascading events. Now, many of you have also heard of epigenetics. And just in case you haven't, I'll give you a simple definition. Epigenetics is the impact of environmental factors on the degree of gene expression in an organism. So this could be a microbe, a plant, an earthworm, a bird, our livestock, us. We're all impacted by epigenetic effects. And epigenetic effects follow the rule of compounding. They are never singular in nature and they're never neutral in nature. They're either positive or negative. So what we do also impacts the epigenetics of every organism out there. And the thing about epigenetics that we must remember 
is that epigenetics is transgenerational in nature. So what we do today impacts what happens tomorrow and 50 years from now and 100 years from now. The second rule is the rule of diversity. We want highly diverse and complex pastures. And if we're using annuals, annual mixes, not monocultures. Now, over the last several decades, and even when I was an academic, when I was teaching at the university, you know, monocultures, the latest and greatest varieties and cultivars were what we always preached and, and advocated for people to use. And, and that's what we always tested. You know, it, it's very rare in the academic world that there's a lot of research around complexity and diversity in perennial pastures and in annual pastures. But the more diverse and the more complex your pastures and your rangeland are, the fewer problems you're going to have. And we're going to delve into that a little more tonight as, as we go further in this presentation. But just remember that the solution to many of the problems that we currently face are due to the fact that we have monocultures and near monocultures. We have either monocultures or low diversity pastures and rangeland. And that is very burdensome on being able to properly manage our grazing impact and our biology. So what do we want? We want as many different functional plant class groups as possible in every field and in all our rangeland. Functional plant class groups include things such as grasses, legumes, forbs, and woody species. I prefer to see all of those in our pastures, even the woodies. I don't want to be overrun with any of these, but I definitely want to see a good mix of all of those because they all perform a job in attracting a very wide array of microbial species that then go to work for me. Now, why complexity and diversity? Well, first of all, because it produces a host of positive compounding and cascading effects. Secondly, because diverse plant species, particularly woody species and the forbs, broadleaves and all of that, produce a host of secondary and tertiary compounds as are taught by and, and discovered by Dr. Fred Provenza and his colleagues and many others. And Fred talks a lot about this in his book, Nourishment. Complexity of diversity in plant species also provides and facilitates diversity in microbial species and diversity in macroorganisms. And the impact produced by this diversity gives us exponential rather than linear results. Now these forbs out there that we commonly call weeds actually have a purpose. And, and if you've ever heard me speak, you've heard me ask the audience to define a weed. And I've done that every single time that I speak somewhere and I've yet to ever hear anybody anywhere give me an objective definition of a weed. Every definition that they give is always subjective and it's subject to their interpretation of what a weed is. So there is no such thing as an objective definition of a weed and therefore that really means scientifically there is no such thing as a weed. They are just simply another group of plants, another functional plant class group. And they definitely are there for a reason. They have a purpose. We often see these weeds growing where we have done something to scar the soil. We overgrazed, we tilled, we fed hay in a one spot all winter long whatever we may have done. Typically, when we see these so-called weeds proliferate and dominate in a pasture on rangeland, it's our fault. We created 
that scenario through our management practices because we disturbed and or degraded the soil. So Gabe often shows these slides in his presentation and certainly the first question you want to ask yourself, no matter what you see growing out there, every plant that you see, you need to ask yourself, what is nature trying to tell me? So if we see dandelions growing, they may be telling us that we have soil compaction problems and calcium issues. If we see buttercup out there, it's often telling us that we have poorly drained soils and we have disturbed the soil significantly. Right now, throughout the entire Southeast US, these things are growing everywhere. I see fields that are completely yellow with buttercup blossoms everywhere. But when you look at how those fields were grazed last year and managed through the winter, we know precisely why we're seeing these proliferate. Quack grass is telling us that soils are anaerobic, compacted, aluminum issues, bindweed compacted soils, Russian thistle, high salts or salinated soils, leafy spurge, boron issues, chicory, calcium, hairy vetch, cobalt, plantain, copper, Canada thistle, iodine, lamb's quarter, manganese, stinging nettle, nitrogen, giant ragweed, nitrogen, and we could go on and on, but you get the point. Every weed is growing there to try to correct an issue that we created. They are nature's first line of defense. That's the reason a plant we call a weed grows there first. And depending on the year and what the need is and, and the deficiency in the soil may be, that's going to determine which type of, quote, weed from that seed bank responds and exposes itself to try to correct that problem. In this video, these are cows in Minnesota that have been turned on to a field that was completely overtaken by giant ragweed. Now every weed that I showed you in that series of slides just now, livestock will eat. And there's many, many more that I did not show you that yes, livestock will eat. And as you can see, these cows have absolutely no issue whatsoever eating this giant ragweed. Now I want you to note something else though. Note what you see flying around above these cattle eating this giant ragweed. We've got a lot of birds in action here. They look like swallows helping to take care of the flies on these cattle and feasting on those flies. This is the end result. As those cattle moved under high density in polywire paddocks, temporary paddocks through this giant ragweed, you can see that they produced a high degree of trample. And this particular farmer was able to go in there and drill a cash crop right into that trampled down ragweed. So diversity is key. Again, critically important, the more diversity, the better. And again, as we get in a little later into some of the grazing issues, diversity solves the vast majority of the issues that we face today. Manage for diversity and don't sweat the weeds. The weeds are part of your diversity. Many of those secondary and tertiary compounds that are produced by those weeds are highly medicinal and antiparasitic in nature. So when you have far greater diversity and forbs and those types of things in your rangeland or in your pasture, you're going to have far, far healthier livestock. You're going to have far less parasite issues, both internal and external parasites. That's just a function of diversity and those secondary and tertiary compounds that are being produced. That's how our wild ruminants were able to make it without keeling over dead from heavy internal parasite loads and that type of thing. They had a far more diverse diet 
than we provide to most of our domesticated livestock. Now, in terms of that diversity, what are we really looking for? You know, I mentioned the four functional plant class groups, grasses, legumes, forbs, or broadleaves, and woody species. Typically, if we look at a lot of grasslands and prairies around the world, and we go back 500 to 1,000 years or more and look at what those scenarios were like and the diversity and the ratio of those of the different functional plant class groups to each other, what we find is that legumes were a much smaller component, typically only about 10% of the total component in that mix. So far, far less than what many grazers have today in terms of a legume component. Secondly, they had a fairly substantial forb component, many times anywhere from 25 to 40 percent. And then the rest of that was made up of grass species. So somewhere between 50 and 60 percent was made up of the grass species comprised with some woody species. So that was a typical component. And today, for those of us that are using adaptive stewardship grazing, we are finding that that same type of species composition and functional plant class group composition is working incredibly well for us. So the next rule is the rule of disruption. And I'm really gonna hammer on this tonight because this is one of the very best ways that you can take your grazing to the next level in 2020 and that you can have a very successful grazing season this year and beyond. Because what you do here with the rule of disruption builds very positive compounding and cascading effects that not only positively impact the 2020 grazing season, but impact grazing seasons five years and 10 years down the road. So when we talk about disruption, the first thing that we have to remember is that nature has tremendous resilience and responds well to challenges. But those challenges need to be planned, purposeful disruptions. Nature created these disruptions routinely before we interfered. And these disruptions came in the form of floods, of drought, of predators, fire, all of those types of things were disruptions from nature. And, you know, longer, harsher winters, all of these things were disruptions from nature that helped, helped the biology to build resilience. So the next time that biology experienced that same challenge, it could respond well. Now, again, if you've heard me speak before, you've heard me use this analogy to be able to describe the rule of disruption. If we think about the human body, we think about ourselves, and, and we think about human athletes, to be a champion athlete, you must introduce disruption routinely into your exercise regime. If you do the same exercises at the same duration, same intensity, day after day, year after year, you will hit a wall that you will not be able to go beyond and you will peak and then you will start to dig digress or regress. You will start going backwards. You cannot maintain the same level of performance. The only way that an elite athlete becomes elite is to purposefully introduce these disruptions in their exercise routine. So how can we be disruptive? Well, do not do things the same way every time. It's that simple. But this is, that's the hardest thing for us as grazers. We, we want to follow a routine, a recipe, a formula, a prescription. And then oftentimes what we find is we see people that develop a or change their grazing or they develop a new grazing system or method but then they turn it 
into a prescription or a recipe or a formula. And over a period of three to five years, typically, they hit a wall and it ceases to work for them anymore. And they wonder what happened. Why does it not work anymore? I'm still doing it that way. Well, that's the very reason it's not working any longer. You're still doing it the same way. So how can we be disruptive in our grazing? This is not a definitive list, but these do certainly hit the high points to some of the things that we can do immediately and through the course of this grazing season to be disruptive. We can alter our stock densities. I call it pulsing of stock density. So never pick a stock density. Don't say 100,000 pounds is the magic, that's the key, that's where I need to be at from this point forward, or 200,000 or whatever it may be. Do not pick a stock density out of thin air and determine that that's the key to your success. As a matter of fact, it'll be just the opposite. It'll be the key to your frustration. So alter or pulse your stock densities. Do not move through the same rotations in the same pattern, you're in and you're out. Start in different pastures, different paddocks each year after you come out of the winter. Alter the grazing heights on and off. Many who follow what we call a management intensive or mid grazing system want to have a finite starting height when they start to graze and they want to come off at a finite height every time when they end that grazing event. If you do that, you are going to significantly limit your biology and your soil. You're going to limit and narrow even your plant species diversity, and you're going to limit the forage biomass production capacity and potential, and you're going to limit your livestock performance. And with that type of grazing, the next point, alter rest periods, is also a problem because many that practice that type of grazing believe that, okay, I have to be back in every paddock within 21 days, 30 days, 35 days, 45 days, whatever it may be. Again, that's a prescription, that's a formula, and you will encounter the exact same problems that I just described if you don't alter the grazing heights. Now, if you're like many of us, you also are grazing multiple species. So if you're doing that, if you're grazing cattle, sheep, goats, pigs, chickens, whatever, from time to time, alter the species order that they're moving through your fields. You would be amazed at the difference in results and the way that that stimulates renewed biological activity. And then finally, alter the time of season or year that you're grazing in a particular area. And this is critically important if you're in a semi-arid or arid region, a desert type region. Altering, if you're hitting the same areas at the same time year after year after year, you are narrowing the plant species and further de desertifying those areas. So you need to alter the time of season or year and alter the stock density and the animal units and so forth uh, that you're utilizing. So what's the best tool in your toolbox? Well, it is simply this, observation. So we want to be keen observers. And to do that, you've got to use all your senses, the sense of sight, sound, smell, touch, and yes, even taste. Many of us now taste the plants, the leaf material of the plants that are growing in many of our fields and on the rangeland, because that flavor profile does tell you a lot about the secondary and tertiary metabolites or nutri nutrients that are being produced by those plants. It tells you how nutrient dense those plants are. And you want to observe the soil, the plants, the insects, the birds, the livestock. Observe everything. 
and constant observation develops very keen intuition. And once you develop intuition, you're going to instinctively make far better decisions. So every day, don't think you're too busy to observe. As a matter of fact, that is the most important thing you should do on a day in day out basis when you're grazing your livestock. You should observe, observe, observe. And again, this is representative of all the things that we should be observing out there. So again, we should be observing our soil, what's on and in our soil. What does the aggregate look like? Do we have you know, living organisms like earthworms in that soil? We should be observing the plants. How many different plant species? What's the diversity in both the species and the functional groups? We should be observing for pollinators as we increase diversity, and we increase biological impact, we're gonna see a lot more pollinators and a lot more of many other types of insects. Dung beetles should be returning. We should see lots of birds, many different species, and a huge explosion in bird populations. We should see a lot of predators like spiders returning, and we want to observe the manure of our livestock each and every day, as well as observing the livestock and their gut fill. So all of these things are things that we should be including in our observation skills. Now here's some other tools though that you need to be using very routinely. Every time you go into a field, before you get ready to graze that field, before you move your livestock in, these are the things that you need to be doing. You need to be using a shovel. You need to carry a shovel with you all the time. Keep it in your truck, keep it in your UTV, on your ATV, whatever you're using. I like to use a spade or a sharpshooter to be able to do this, but just dig up divots of soil and look at the soil, look at the aggregate layer, look at that layer of thatch on top of the soil, how thick is it? Is the biology adequately degrading that? Do you see evidence of saprophytic fungi? You know, do, you see, do you see earthworms and so forth? Um, and smell the aroma of the soil. The aroma tells you a lot about the biological profile and biological activity in that soil. And it even tells you whether your soil is more aerobic or more anaerobic in nature. So the aroma is critically important. A thermometer, and this can be an infrared or thermal thermometer, it makes it pretty easy, just point and shoot. Or you can carry a, a, you know, a regular soil thermometer that you can stick the probe in the ground. But measure temperatures, know what your soil temperature is, both at the surface and below the surface. A refractometer, this is critical for measuring bricks. Bricks, plant bricks is critical to both plant health and performance. It's critical to your soil biology and the microorganisms, the insects and all of that. And it's critical to the health of the livestock and their performance. So plant bricks is something that you need to be measuring and monitoring routinely throughout the active growing season. Again, it's very, very simple to do. We have many presentations on this. Uh, we're not gonna get, go into a lot of detail on it tonight, uh, but we do have a lot of resource materials available on measuring plant bricks and monitoring bricks. Uh, and a refractometer is a very, very cheap investment to be able to do this. It also, by monitoring plant bricks, it helps you to determine far better when to graze a certain area on your farm or ranch and when to anticipate the best performance. Also measure routinely water infiltration rates in various fields. You can carry a simple single ring infiltrometer and you can take like six inch irrigation pipe or even six inch PVC pipe in diameter. So you, you can take a six inch diameter pipe cut it six inches in length, and you've got a single ring infiltration ring that you can utilize. And again, we've got a lot of information on how to do this, and you can even Google uh, 
single ring infiltrometers and, and how to use them. And there's a lot of good videos on YouTube to show you how to measure infiltration rates. All of these tools are very cheap and easy to use. And they're something that everybody should be taking advantage of. If you're not, you are missing some tremendous learning opportunities and a tremendous amount of data that will be more valuable to you as you go year to year to year. Now, another thing that I want to talk about tonight is the microbiome in your soil. There are striking similarities <clears throat> between the microbiome in humans, animals, plants, and the soil. We all came from the same place and we all share the same microbiome. So what we do to the soil significantly impacts the microbiome in the plants that are growing in that soil, in the animals that eat those plants, and then ultimately in us because we eat the plants and we eat the animals. So we must consider that microbiome each and every day and we just released a blog on how the microbiome in all of these things, including the microbiome in our own bodies, impacts our health and our longevity. So in that microbiome, all of these microbes, all of those different species are going to be intricately linked in either a symbiotic or an antagonistic relationship. And whether it's symbiotic or antagonistic is highly dependent on our management, on our daily decisions, what we do. What happens with one inevitably affects the other. And these interactions also produce epigenetic effects, as I talked about earlier, that are compounding and cascading in nature and are transgenerational. So I want you to remember that biology grows out. This is a critical concept. Biology grows out like a ripple effect in a pond. If I take a pebble and I throw it into a pond or a lake, we're going to produce rings of ripples that continue to spread throughout the confines of that pond or that lake until those ripples reach the shore. Biology does the same thing. So we want to grow biology out. It takes biology to grow biology. That is another critical concept. So because biology grows out and because it takes biology to grow biology, we must focus first on the low hanging fruit. In other words, find areas where we already have good biological activity. Now, many of us approach the way that we try to improve our pastures or our rangeland quite the opposite. We want to focus on the worst areas first. We want to, we want to take those areas that are significantly degraded, uh, that have very low biological activity, and try to do something to improve them. Now, Alejandro Correa will tell you, working in the desert, that that is not the way to do things. That if you focus on the worst areas first and try to grow the biology there initially, you're going to become very frustrated and eventually you're gonna give up and you're gonna say, this doesn't work. It doesn't work. Instead, find the areas where you have evidence of biological activity, start there with your adaptive stewardship grazing and produce that ripple effect. Use the biology of your livestock and the microbes on and in those livestock that they are going to shed through their saliva. They're gonna shed from their hair coat with every step that they take and they're going to shed in their manure that they leave behind. 
they're leaving behind microbes on that soil where they grazed that are then gonna communicate with the microbes in the soil. And this is called quorum sensing. And the microbes in the soil are then gonna to respond to that communication from the microbes that were shed by your livestock. And it's gonna hyper stimulate and create hyperactivity in the microbes in the soil. And so you're gonna get this ripple effect of the biology growing out. And this is a perfect example. These pictures were all taken by Alejandro down in Mexico and Chihuahua. And when we look at these, they are perfect examples of biology growing out. So you'll see wherever there's a manure pat where the cow dropped biology, dropped a microbiome onto the soil. And then those microbes communicated with the microbes in the soil and stimulated seed germination and stimulated growth of grass, of plants around that cow pie. So again, it takes biology to grow biology. So this is biology on a micro scale. That cow and her leave behind manure, both the impact while she was moving across and actively shedding, coupled with the leave left behind manure, created a micro ecosystem of biology that then stimulates the growth there. And then if you look on the bottom left hand picture, this is how they do it in the desert. This is what Alejandro and, and, and his colleagues in the states of Chihuahua and Cahuilla have done. They've identified areas where you have evidence of biology. So here you have some grass growing and you can see beyond that, there's a lot of bare soil. But instead of moving your cattle onto the bare soil first and focusing there, you concentrate, aggregate, the cattle here where you have evidence of biology, quickly, short duration, high density, then move them off. You don't want to damage it, you want to stimulate it. And then that produces that ripple effect that grows that biology out. These pictures were also supplied by Alejandro and this shows mine, uh, a, a mine, again in the state of Chihuahua, that was stripped down bare due to the mining activities. And by using cattle and bales of hay to create biological impact to introduce a microbiome to those strip mined areas, you can see what happens. You get significant biological stimulation even in that stripped down soil and you start to get new growth. And from this picture, you can see what happens is the cattle are moved in paddocks across the landscape of this mined area. You see each paddock and you can see the progression that is being made here. And of course, you can see towards the middle of the picture, the current paddock that the cattle are in. And you can see that they're under a very high density in that paddock, but for a very short, duration of time on the bale grazing. So to finish up this evening, I wanna talk about how to get started right this spring. So here's the deal guys, how you start your spring grazing is going to ultimately determine what happens in the success of the rest of your entire grazing season. Make a mistake now and you will be paying for it for the rest of the grazing season and even beyond, depending on the severity of that mistake. If you overgraze in the spring and particularly overgraze too early, your pastors will pay for it for the rest of the year. So move, move, move your livestock. Move them frequently, short duration. Many times in the spring, as we get this new flush of growth, what we do is what we call flash grazing for that very first graze. We move the livestock across very rapidly. 
allowing them to take no more than the top 30% at best and continue to move them. So by the time we come back around the next time, we have significantly greater growth. And the beautiful thing about that initial flash graze is that again, we're introducing the microbiome of that animal to the microbiome of the plant and the soil. And they are interacting during that flash graze. And we have seen time and time again, just that one flash graze microbiome impact have a stimulatory effect, very, very similar to having applied a high level of fertilizer to that soil. Proper rest and recovery of plants and the plant roots is very important. And another thing that you need to remember is what you did, how you managed those pastures or that rangeland last fall and winter will impact the 2020 grazing season as well. So if you allowed them to graze it down too tight last fall or through the winter on stockpile grazing and you, grubbed it, you allowed them to grub it all the way down and expose the soil, that's gonna significantly and detrimentally harm your grazing for the 2020 season. Now, many of us say, well, Alan, you know, we've got, we start grazing that new flush of growth in the spring and we get a lot of runny cattle or, or, or runny livestock, whatever the species may be. The manure is very loose and runny. Uh, and we know that they're getting way too much protein in that diet. Well, there, there's multiple ways to manage that. One is you can feed dry hay while you are grazing those, that new lush spring growth. Now, many of you say, well, I can't get them to eat the hay anymore. All they wanna do is graze that new lush growth and they're squirting out the back end. Well, you can get them to graze it, number one, before you turn them out, tank them up on dry forage. And number two, you can pull them on and off of that lush forage if, if you're doing adaptive grazing, it's easy to move them on a day in, day out basis. You can pull them on and off and, and make sure that they do eat at least a few bites of dry hay every day. Another very good way to manage this is the prior season stockpile. Save a pasture or two to be your starting pasture for spring grazing that was stockpiled the fall prior. So now you've got a lot of that old stockpile growth intermingled with the new spring flush that's growing up underneath. And so with every bite that they take of the new flush of growth, they're also getting a mouthful of the old fall stockpile, just like eating dry hay, and it helps to balance them out. And of course, a third way that you can help manage that is you can wait, simply wait until you turn them out. Uh, and just wait just a little longer until you get some pastures that are closer to mid-stage maturity and then turn them out and do a flash graze across all of that so it doesn't get way ahead of you and go a lot of it try to go reproductive on you. So it's critically important to note that as these new plants start to grow in the in the spring that it's very very easy to overgraze them you have to remember what's growing underneath the soil in terms of winter root reserve those carbohydrates that have been stored there all winter to fuel and facilitate that new spring flush and if you overgraze too quickly then you help you will have depleted those root carbohydrate reserves and you will have put your plant in a negative energy balance. Now, I know there's some dairy grazers and dairy producers in the session tonight, and you understand what it means to put a dairy cow into a negative energy balance when she's lactating very heavily and the issues that that can create. Well, just like you can put that cow into a negative energy balance, you can put your plants into a negative energy balance as well. And you're going to make them far more susceptible to pest and disease, to frost and freeze and drought, 
and so on and so forth. So as the soil warms up and your plants try to grow, those roots are going to use those root carbohydrate reserves to first stimulate biological activity in the soil. They're going to release some of those reserves into the soil in the form of root exudates to tell those microbes, wake up and go to work and feed me because I need to grow. So they need those reserves to be able to feed those microbes so those microbes can help fuel the growth of that plant. So what that plant is going to do first is it's going to send up a shoot and then form a collar. And you're gonna get a leaf growing out of that first collar. And basically that first phase of growth to produce that new leaf, that first leaf on that plant in the spring, uses up the root carbohydrate reserves. There's very, very little photosynthetic activity involved in this. Then the plant produces a second shoot and a second leaf. That is when the plant starts relying more on photosynthetic activity rather than the carbohydrate root reserves. And then it's going to form a third leaf. Now the time at the time the third leaf formation and we get that third solar panel on that plant so to speak now the plant is transitioning very heavily into reliance on photosynthetic activity rather than carbohydrate root reserves and then the plant continues to grow so you want to make sure that your plant has grown to the stage that it is now relying on photosynthetic activity from the sun instead of those carbohydrate root reserves. So hitting it too early is going to set that plant back for the entire rest of the grazing season. And oftentimes when we do that, that's when we see a proliferation of these weeds, the forbs that we call weeds. They're trying to fill in those spots because your grasses aren't growing now. They're, they're set back. So now that provided the opportunity for those forbs to come up and proliferate. So if you overgraze too early, before you get to this stage where the plants are relying on photosynthetic activity, then you're going to significantly damage the plant, the roots, and the entire grazing season. And I want to point this out as well as you go through your grazing season, and this is going to become more important as we get hotter and drier going into the summer and into next fall. If we allow our animals too routinely to take more than 50% of the leaf volume of our plants, then we're going to have significantly higher root growth stoppage. Compounding cascading effects, guys, compounding cascading effects. If we have significant root growth stoppage, then we're going to have a whole host of negative compounding effects occurring beneath the soil and above the soil. So if we look at the diagram or the chart on the right hand side of this slide, you'll see up in A versus B. In A, we allowed our livestock to graze down too tight. And you see the negative compounding cascading effects that occur here. We have significant root die off. And now the living root material is much closer to the soil surface. That means we have significant microbial die-off. Those microbes are no longer being fed by the root exudates. And it means that because of the microbial die-off, we don't have the mineral cycling occurring prior to that. So now that plant is not getting fed like it was prior to the severe grazing. It also means that because of the microbial die-off that we are losing a significant amount of our biotic glues in the soils, both through degradation of the biotic glues and through hungry soil bacteria seeking carbon to eat. So they'll consume those biotic glues. Now you collapse your soil aggregate. This plant desperately needs water, but now your soil can't infiltrate that water anywhere nearly as well. 
you've removed most of your solar panel on your plant. So now photosynthetic activity is gonna be very slow to resume. You've depleted the carbohydrate reserves in that plant. And there's many, many other negative compounding and cascading effects. Your soil temperature heats up, which significantly damages the microbes. And we have significant evaporation loss of the soil moisture. However, if you look in the example in B, if we allow them to take no more than 50% of the total leaf volume, then you can see that we've left plenty of root reserves beneath the soil surface. We've protected our microbes, we've protected our aggregate, we've protected our water infiltration capacity, we've protected our soil temperature, we've protected our solar panel, and we've protected our plants. So everything performs far better and recovers much faster. So some final tips to leave you with this evening, and then we'll go to questions. Combine your herds or your flocks into as few herds or flocks as possible. The more you try to manage on a single farm or ranch, the more you're gonna drive yourself crazy. There is no need to have a whole bunch of different herds and flocks on the same farm or ranch. Uh, we have found that when you combine them, you get significant familial reestablishment, reestablishment of family-like behavior in your herds and flocks. And this is very, very detrimental to their health and their performance, and even the way that they graze and respond to grazing impact. Secondly, make certain that your livestock every day have the nutrition they need, day in and day out. Provide them enough forage dry matter and provide them with plenty of plant bricks. You increase plant bricks by increasing soil biological activity. It is that simple. So day in and day out, make sure they have enough to eat and that it's nutritious enough for them. Third, do not let water be your roadblock. Many, many grazers say, well, Alan, I can't graze that particular field the way I want to because I'm very limited on water. We can solve our water problems, folks. It may take a little investment, but it's an investment, not a cost, because I have always been able to make water investments pay, and they pay handsomely. So never let water be your roadblock. Uh, you know, Alejandro and his colleagues in Mexico in the desert have not let water be their roadblock, and they can certainly, if anybody has an excuse to let water be a roadblock, it's it's people operating in in desert environments, but they have not let it be their roadblock and many others that we work with have not let water be their roadblock. And then finally, selection and culling. And it's more important than ever now, make certain that you are selecting for animals that perform in your environment with the plant species that are growing there, with the microbiome that exists there. Do not try to force the wrong genetics and the wrong phenotype into your environment. They need to be highly adaptive to that environment. And the only way that you can assure that is to cull those animals that are not performing under adaptive stewardship management. It is that simple. If they're not performing, get rid of them. Do not make excuses for them. What many are taught, unfortunately, and to divulge, you know, what I used to do and what I used to teach as an academic and an extension professional, we used to teach farmers and ranchers to feed to the poorest performing of your livestock. Boy, what bad advice. And for years, I gave that advice, okay? 
feed up to the worst performing. You'll go broke very rapidly doing that. That's why you don't make any money. Call stringently, call often, call ruthlessly, call. And you will be selecting herds and flocks that perform exceptionally well in your environment. And nothing could be better, folks. I promise you that because I've lived through the other personally. I made every excuse in the book. I crutched them up. I supplemented them up. I did everything I should not have done, believing I was being a good husbandman and I was doing the right thing. And all I was doing was propagating problems. I was propagating animals that could not perform in my environment. When you alter that, many of the problems that we think are just inherent, all of a sudden start to disappear and they go away. And in the time of this pandemic, selection and culling are critically important as well because we need to make absolutely sure that every dollar counts and that every animal out there is working hard for us. So that's my webinar tonight. There's many, many more things that we could have covered. I understand that, but we had a limited time frame. Uh, you know, if, if many of you listening tonight have specific topics that you would like to cover in a lot more detail, please let us know and we'll make sure that we set up a webinar to do just that. So now, uh, I want to open it up to questions, and, and Gabe, I'm going to turn it back over to you, and, uh, and uh, myself, Gabe, Shane, Ray, David, Alejandro, and, and others of the Understanding Ag team will be very happy to answer any questions that you may have this evening. Well, thank you, Alan. Very informative and definitely a timely topic. The first question this this evening is from Gina, and Gina and her family have a pastured dairy in the Azores. They have a perennial pasture, which after grazing, they would like to broadcast seed a sorghum crop into four baling. They would like to know, will it germinate and will birds be an issue? Okay, I'll start and then Gabe, Shane, Ray, David, anybody else that wants to chime in, please feel free to do so. So if you're going to broadcast, and that's what you're talking about doing, uh, then there's several things that, that, that are important here to have decent success. One is you got to make sure that you have adequate soil moisture. Okay? Uh, the, the one thing that's going to create optimum germination in seed as proper seed to soil contact. And you can't get that accomplished without good soil moisture. So you want to broadcast seed when you have decent soil moisture. Secondly, you want to do everything that you can to establish firm seed to soil contact. So after broadcasting, you want to run some livestock across it under some density so that they can help walk that seed in. Now you don't want it to be severe, but you want it to be enough impact that just their, their hoof action on that seed can create good seed to soil contact. Uh, so that's gonna be important as well. Third, you're going to have to broadcast at a higher seeding rate if you, if you want to have good success than if you were to drill that seed in. So anytime you broadcast, you're always going to need to use a higher seeding rate. So Gabe, uh, Shane, David, anybody else that, that's from our team that wants to add anything to that? I think, Ellen, that you covered that well. Uh, this particular individual, they do not have a drill available. Uh, so that's why they were going to broadcast 
The only thing I would add to that is obviously we're going with sorghum you want to make sure it's the right time of the year sorghum being a warm season grass you want to make sure that temperatures are conducive and that you have a long enough growing season remaining for that warm season grass yeah next, I would, go ahead i would uh just add one quick thing to that as well sure. gabe so so you're correct soil temperatures need to be at least 60 degrees when you're looking at sorghum, sorghum sedan grasses, that type of thing to get good, you know, really good performance out of them. And then the other thing is, do not try to come in and graze it too quickly. Let it get firmly established before you come back in to graze. Yes, good point. The next question, how important is it to move livestock daily? Well, you're asking me and I'm gonna say, critically important uh the now move them as often as you can okay you know if, if you if you've been a set stock or continuous grazer start with once a week if that's the best you can do initially you're going to see favorable results particularly if you manage and don't overgraze uh, but the more you move them folks the better and quicker your results are going to be. It truly, truly is that simple. And it doesn't matter whether you're in my type of environment, a hot, humid environment here in the deep south in the US. It doesn't matter whether you're up in Gabe's environment in North Dakota or up in Canada. And it doesn't matter if you're down in Alejandro Correa's environment down in the desert of Mexico. Daily movement works and it's critical to building biology as rapidly as possible. I'm gonna ask if Alejandro would address that. Being from a desert environment, uh, oftentimes Alejandro, people in very large scale operations think that it's just too much work for them to move daily. Would you please address that? If Alejandro no Ella Alejandro there you go yeah can you hear me guys we can okay yeah uh, in the beginning we also thought that it would be a lot of work um, involved but actually the results that we got from moving from now, uh, now, excuse me Alejandro you're just not coming through very clear okay okay yeah I'm not a branch prefer limited uh, connectivity Alejandro we're gonna have to ask that you um, perhaps type your answer into the Q&A if you're able uh, so that people can read it I'm going to move on to the next question. We'll start with you, Alan. With combining herds and flocks, do you have any hesitation with flirts of combined species? For example, will cattle spook sheep? If yes, is it better to run these different animals sequentially since the different species prefer different forages? Okay, so first of all, do I have any problem with running them together in a flirt? Absolutely not. Uh, as a matter of fact, I love that. Okay, that there's, there's significant benefits from that. Uh, however, if you have not been doing that, then yes, you, you need to acquaint them with each other uh, and, and get them used to each other before you start trying to move them around your farm or ranch on a larger scale uh, because you can that there can be issues if they have never been together before you know the uh, you know the sheep sometimes can frighten cattle and vice versa uh, or goats or whatever the case may be and in pigs particularly I've seen uh, you know if, if sheep and cattle are not used to pigs uh, the pigs can definitely frighten them initially so so you've got to introduce them to each other but once you do, then yes, you can, you can run them together and you can get some very positive impacts from that. 
uh, and in the impacts are really fairly similar as long as you manage it appropriately, whether you're running them together or you're running them sequentially. Uh, you're absolutely right in that the different livestock species will utilize different plants in different ways. Uh, and they'll have a different microbiome impact on the soil. So, uh, so do one of the two, you know, either, either run them together, but first again, as I said, acquaint them to each other to make sure you're not gonna have issues or run them sequentially. Now, as I mentioned earlier, on a normal sequence, uh, you would run either cattle and or sheep or goats first. Uh, and oftentimes we'll run cattle first, followed by sheep and goats, then chickens, then pigs. But we often shake up that sequence to have a planned disruption. But in a normal sequence, that's typically what you're going to find us doing. Thank, thank you, Ellen. The next question has to do with mineral content of plants. Is the mineral content of plants higher when growth is faster, or is the mineral content higher at plant maturity? Alan? Okay. So, first of all, mineral content is highest when you have the greatest biological activity. Okay. So we need to be thinking of it in terms of biological activity first and foremost, rather than stage of plant growth. Now, does stage of plant growth have something to do with it? Well, sure it does. But if you've limited it to begin with because you've limited soil biology, it doesn't matter. You're not gonna have enough mineral content no matter the stage of growth and you're gonna to have to do a lot of mineral supplementation. So first and foremost, focus on building soil biology. That soil biology will stimulate and kickstart the mineral cycle. And then that will create a much higher level of mineral in your, your plant species. Now, in the work, in the research that we've done, what we have found is that the highest mineral content is right around mid-stage maturity. That means when you're close to, you're right around the boot stage of your grasses. That's when you're gonna have the, the highest concentration of minerals in that plant. Great answer, Alan. I would just add that that shows the importance to have a refractometer and to use it to be able to test your plants see where the BRICS levels are, and it also shows the importance of diversity in your paddocks. The more diversity you have, the more plants you're gonna have at that mid-stage maturity. Anyone else have anything to add to that? Okay, moving on. Ryan asks, I have a field that is basically dead and I'm using cattle at higher stock density along with hay to rebuild. I noticed that I am getting elm and other woody tree sprouts showing up instead of grass at this point. Do you have any advice? Shane, can we start with you on this one? Shane's on mute. Yep, Shane's on mute. Okay, Alan, why don't you take okay, off? Okay, thank you, Gabe. Oh. <clears throat> there we go. <clears throat> so he's starting to notice. Can you hear me now, Gabe? Yes. Alan, Shane's on mute. Would you take this, please? Yeah, yeah. All right, so I, I was smiling, Gabe, as you read the question because uh, we have – been through that same experience and uh and originally in earlier years as i would experience that 
I was deeply concerned about the woody species encroaching ash, elm, whatever it may be. And I was all about how can I mow that? How can I spray it? You know, what can I do to get rid of all of these woody species that are, that are all of a sudden coming up? Uh, but what I now know is there's a reason that woody species is coming up just like any other form, any other quote weed. At it, it, that point, it's a quote weed because it is responding to the, the degradation of the soil, okay, the scars on the soil. And that's what nature is putting there initially to respond to try to heal the issues that are in that soil. Now, one very, very good thing about woody species is that they form very strong mycorrhizal fungi associations. So for that reason, I don't mind woody species because those mycorrhiza that are attaching to the roots of those woody species, as I get grass growing in there, are gonna attach to the roots of those plants. And I'm gonna have a really, really good bacteria to fungi ratio in that field. Uh, so rather what you need to do is keep on keeping on. Don't be too concerned about the woody species. Grass will outcompete woody species with the right stimulation. Uh, and again, we've seen this in the desert. Uh, you know, Alejandro has, has pointed this out time and time again, how grass in the desert is out competing the woody species there. So manage for what you want, not for what you don't want. Continue to graze under density, give proper rest periods so that as you stimulate that latent seed bike, you're gonna get results. Uh, you know, bale grazing is another thing that you can do in those woody areas. And folks, bale grazing is not just something to do in the winter. Bale grazing can be very advantageous at any time of the year uh, and can work very well in the warmer months as well. So, so sometimes in those woody areas, uh, bale grazing can be very advantageous if I do it like in May and June and I can stimulate, I've still got plenty of growing season ahead of me. I can stimulate those grass species so that they start to outcompete the woodies. Thank you, Alan. Uh, the next question, uh, first I, I will add, I'm gonna read what Alejandro said. He said, uh, regarding moving livestock daily on large ranches, most ranchers think it takes a lot of work, but in reality, if you have a good water system, it takes more than no more than one hour per day. Plus, there are so many benefits to do it, such as seeing and relating to your cattle daily, you will regenerate your land faster. We have really enjoyed doing it, and nowadays we are doing it twice a day. So, very large ranch, Alejandro's is 30,000 plus acres, moving livestock twice a day in desert environments. The next question is from Joe and Joe asks, is there a problem running yearling heifers with steers and then putting bulls in to breed the heifers? Alan, I'm gonna ask you to address that, please. Okay, uh, we do a tremendous amount of grass finishing and, uh, and, and we produce a very, very high quality end product. As a matter of fact, the last 10 weeks in a row, we harvest every week and truckload lots. Last 10 weeks in a row, we have been at 100% choice and prime every single week. Uh, and, I, and I tell you that because I wanna tell you this, we run steers and heifers together. We don't worry about it at all. We finish them together. We don't worry about it at all. Do we get a little bit of riding? Yes, but not anywhere near what you would think. When you're, when you're running them together and you've been running them together and you 
are moving them daily. And you get that familial relationship there through the daily movements. Then we have far less issues. Really, a lot of these issues between steers and heifers are, are of our own management doing. Uh, and what I have problem putting bulls in there to breed the heifers while they're running with the steers? No, absolutely not. Thank you, Alan. Next question is from Will. And Will wants to know if we have seen an increase in the interest in the Soil Health Academy since the pandemic has worsened. And have those of us who market direct to consumers seen an increased demand in our products? Uh, Shane, are you back on? Can you answer that? <clears throat> Shane was having some internet difficulty there. Uh, Alan, you care to answer first? So have we seen increased interest in the academy and in regenerative agriculture? Absolutely. Um, and, and it's coming from all facets. It's not just coming from farmers and ranchers, uh, but the consumer population as a whole. Uh, so you know, yes, the interest is definitely increasing and it's increasing even more because of the pandemic. Uh, secondly, in terms of sales of, of products produced by regenerative farms and ranches, particularly doing direct market type sales, those have not increased, they have exploded. Uh, I, again, we work with many, many different branded programs and direct marketers around the country. And I have spoken personally with a very large number of them over the past three weeks or so. And pretty much every one of them has seen their sales increase anywhere from 400% to over 1,000%. Many have had their entire year's worth of sales, a normal year's worth of sales occur in just a single month. So what we're seeing, I think, is going to result in a paradigm shift in our food sector in the U.S. and in many other countries. What we're seeing certainly in the U.S. is the consumer becoming more and more aware of the fact that the centralized food system is broken, that there's a lot of bottlenecks, and that they can't trust it but they now know they can go direct to a farmer, a rancher, and buy food. And that is precisely what they're doing. Now, the beautiful thing about that is they're not only learning that they can buy food that way, and they can buy food that was produced locally, and they can buy food that was produced in a manner that is transparent, and they know exactly how it was grown or raised, but also they are discovering much to their delight that these foods that they're buying that, re, that are, have been regeneratively produced taste far better than what they were eating before and is also far healthier for them. So I, I think that we're going to see significant but positive ramifications from all of this for regenerative farmers and ranchers. I agree with that, Alan. I will add that uh, we too have seen a very significant increase in demand for the products that we're marketing direct to consumer. Uh, just today I was on a podcast and, and visiting on the podcast about the ramifications of this pandemic. And don't get me wrong, I do not in any way wanna belittle what is happening. We have to be very concerned about it. Our, our, our hearts certainly go out, go out to those who lost loved ones during this. However, from a farm and ranch and society at standpoint, this is going to, as Alan said, open awareness, but it is also a very, very good opportunity to change the current system and to start changing 
your own production model if you are not marketing direct or adding value in that way. Uh, we're fielding multiple calls daily, inquiries as to, to how they can access nutrient-dense foods. Now, I just want to make the listeners today aware that Understanding Ag is working on several projects where we are, are uh, finding out the nutrient density, the compounds that are in the foods that we eat, and we're comparing these across all aspects of production agriculture, whether you're in a regenerative model, organic model, or quote-unquote conventional model we're seeing some striking differences. And as we get more information available, we'll make that available. But it and is amazing we what we're seeing. We'll make that available. The next question I have is, does the soil communicate with the seed bank in the soil and depending on the health of the soil, will that will determine whether that seed will germinate or not. David Kleinschmidt, are you able to answer that one? Yeah, sorry about that, the delay there. Um, so yeah, with the increase in biological activity with the livestock impact, we can have a significant increase in the latent seed bank or have an impact on that latent seed bank to kind of wake it up, um, you know, and, and have a more diverse uh, forages out there, grasses, legumes, um, broadleaf. And then even if we were to, you know, seed a pasture and a mix, but if we use the adaptive grazing practices, you know, we'll see more forages out there than what we even sown. Um, so a lot of times, you know, we wouldn't even need to be able to see the pasture if we just use the practices of adaptive stewardship to uh, increase the, the seed bank out there kind of naturally. Very good. Right. Alan, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Well, I would just refer and say that uh, you know, the, the more biological activity you stimulate, the greater that microbiome interaction, then the more seed you're going to see germinate, the more species, the more diversity you're going to have. It, it truly is that simple. It don't, don't make it complicated. Microbi highly active and diverse microbiomes stimulate a much more highly active and diverse seed bank. Very good. One more question here. Speaking of mineral or nutrient content, do plants have the highest bricks readings at certain times of the day? And is that when we should be moving our livestock? There you go, Alan. Okay. Well, you're, you're throwing me softballs now, Gabe. That's right. Uh, okay, so, so yes, absolutely. Uh, plant bricks uh, fluctuate every 24-hour photo period. Uh, when the sun goes down, the carbohydrate reserves in the plant and plant sugar start moving towards the base of the plant, and therefore the bricks in the plant goes way down overnight. So by early morning, the bricks is at its lowest point every 24 hour period. And it takes the stimulation of the sunlight in photosynthetic activity to start moving those carbohydrate reserves back up to the top of the plant, okay, to the leaf material and all of that. So bricks is at its highest in any given 24 hour photo period in the afternoon after you have had several hours of sunlight stimulating photosynthetic activity. So does that determine when you need to move your livestock? Oh, you bet it does. Move your livestock in the afternoon. That's when you're gonna be able to take advantage of the highest bricks of, of every day. 
Very good. And we're often seeing gains on stocker cattle, a quarter to a half a pound a day per head increase uh, if we move in the afternoon. That's correct. That's just so good we're, business. We're moving in the morning. Right. Correct. Okay, Brent asks, he would like a recommendation for bale grazing in the warmer months. Do you roll out the bale before grazing the paddock or then graze and come back to that paddock and put hay in there at a later time and graze again? If we can, Alan, do you want to take that? Okay, well, I'd be happy to start, and then Gabe and anybody else, uh, y'all have all done bale grazing as well. Uh, when I'm doing it in the summer, uh, I'm, I'm using it specifically to, to either stimulate greater diversity in plant species in a certain area, uh, or to help you know, in an area that, that, that needs some help. So, uh, so what I'll do is I graze, I like to graze intact bales. I don't like to roll them out. Uh, I, I, want, I want them to graze uh, intact bales, spread that hay out uh, you know, over that area and, and get as high a density as I possibly can. And one of the beautiful things about bale grazing in the summer is our ground is dry. You know, we, we, we don't have to worry about you know, tracking up with our tractor and things like that, creating ruts. We can easily get the bales out and get them placed. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, our ground's not soaking wet like it usually is here in the winter time. In the deep south, we can be, we can have highly saturated ground because we get so much moisture through those winter months. In the summer, it's much drier. Uh, so I can use a significantly higher stock density there than I potentially could in, in winter bale grazing in our country. And, and that does a tremendous job for us of tapping that latent seed bank and creating more plant species diversity. Shane, would you care to add to that? Nope, Shane's having internet issues. Uh, I would just like to add one thing to that. Bale grazing in the summer is also a very good opportunity to, to balance uh, fiber needs if necessary on livestock. And I'm more talking about lush, more lush growth early on in the year here in the Northern Hemisphere um, in the springtime. But putting out bales is a very good opportunity to do that, to both help balance their fiber needs and to provide higher stock density in certain areas of a paddock. So with that, uh, we're about, we are over our time. I would just like to uh, talk a little bit about here we got a couple more questions and these are, these are, well, they're all very good. So uh, maybe we can run a little long here. Here is one from Jay. If running everything in one herd, at what point do replacement heifer calves need to be separated before an accidental breeding happens? Alan? Well, I'll tell you what we do, uh, and Gabe, you, you can share what you do, but, uh, you know, we, we are late weaners. We wean when those calves are an average of about nine to 10 months of age. Uh, and we, we like to do that. Uh, we have, we don't have any heifers getting bred early, even though we have you know, fairly early maturing individuals, but when they're kept in that familial unit like that, there, there's really no issue. Um, so we, we gain quite a few advantages from that. We have no weaning stress whatsoever. Uh, you know, they, they learn a lot more about how to graze from their mothers through that light weaning process. 
and that coupled with no stress of weaning, they just keep right on cranking. We don't have that weaning weight loss and shrink and so forth and illness and all of that that you deal with when you wean earlier and you wean in pins and, and, and so forth. Um, once we wean, uh, the heifers and, and, and steer calves are run together and we, we continue like they're in a finishing operation. Uh, we expose the heifers to breeding for a 45 day period when they're in that 14 to 16 month time period. And after 45 days, the bulls are pulled. 30 days later, I go in and do an ultrasound preg check. Those that are pregnant go right back to the mature cow herd uh, and stay there for the rest of their lives. Those that are open stay with the finishing herd. And, um, and that's, that's how we manage it. Very good. Here's a question from Jonathan. Our cattle don't graze very evenly. They gra they'll graze some areas and totally ignore others. They seem to be avoiding old manure pies. I've been moving them quickly and not worrying too much about it. But is there anything that can be done? Are those biological hotspots that will eventually even out? Uh, I'll start with that one and then I'll ask uh, Alan to fill in. Uh, yes, that could become a, an issue because what's going to happen if you leave areas ungrazed, you're going to have a buildup of biomass. You need to get that trampled down onto the soil surface. What can be done is to increase stock density. You're moving quickly, but you need to make the paddock smaller and increase the density so they're at least trampling those areas that are not being grazed. Alan, would you care to add to that? Yeah, that's precisely the problem. Is this a stock density problem? Uh, so, so you do need to 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 run them under higher density. You can use uh, what we call a high density, low density uh, impact to train them up in that regard to graze more evenly. And if you're not familiar with that, it's a concept that we teach. I'll I'll just very quickly go through the concept. It's uh, you you would build your paddock for one move a day uh, that size, that may be a two acre paddock, three acre paddock, one acre paddock, depending on the number of head or total pounds that you're feeding. And, um, and so you would build that paddock as if you were moving them only once a day. But then at the very front of that paddock, you would build a much, much smaller paddock that is going to create, when they're turned into that much smaller paddock first, an ultra high density concentration, meaning half a million pounds or greater, okay? And after doing that just a few days and they're turned into the high density portion of the paddock, you stand there and watch them for about 30 minutes or so is all it takes until you get a high degree of trample, then take up that strand and let them have the bigger paddock for the entire rest of the 24 hour period. But if you do that for just, a matter of a handful of days in that high density paddock, you'll find a, a very definitive difference in the way they graze the lower density portion of that paddock as well. You have trained them very well through the ultra high density to graze everything much more evenly when even when they're at lower density. Thank you, Alan. Gabe, if I may, yes, <clears throat> you'll yes. find like a um, communication here, but well, too often times we'll see where overgrazing is more of a, a situation where there's ungrazed areas around cow pies where you'll have a lot taller vegetation. So, you know, as Alan stated earlier, you know, make sure we're paying attention to rest periods, make sure that those grasses have fully recovered because too many times guys will try to go in and we don't have enough vegetation so they're trying to utilize high stock density and um, really uh, hurting their forages. So too often than not, we see forages that have been overgrazed 
guys trying to go back into paddocks way too soon <clears throat> versus, you know, older forages that are, you know, oxidizing possibly, you know, in those situations. Shane, since we got you on the line, Chuck asks this, what the weeds indicate about the soil is very interesting. With that mindset, does anyone know what Marsh Elder and Cerisa Lespediza say about my pastures here in North Texas? Shane, you had a, you're familiar with Cerisa Lespediza? Yeah, according to the state of Kansas, it's a noxious weed, but <clears throat> what we're finding is, uh, we're finding if we're in there in early May with our cows, the cattle will utilize the Cerisa. In fact, what we noticed this past year was where we were able to graze that in May, we inhibited the seed production on that Cerisa tremendously this coming fall. Um, so and we came back and we regrazed those areas <clears throat> late summer, but any of the Cerisa did not get trampled or grazed. You know, there was and it and never flowered, and it didn't produce seed. Okay, I will add to that the question about weeds. There are several good books out there on weeds. One of them is uh, Weeds, Guardians of the Soil. Another one is Weeds and What They Tell Us. There are several good books out there that that can help that help explain what weeds are are correcting because weeds actually show up to correct a problem that the soil is having uh, Shane here's another question which you can certainly answer Dr. Elaine Ingham's soil lab training is, is expensive is this training worth the time and investment for learning more about the microbial community or is there more to this training? Well, I know Elaine's changed her schooling since when I took it five or six years ago. Um, yeah, it's worth it. Uh, but most of it, to be honest with you, you know, you can learn on your own, the soil microbiology. Um, I mean, not sure you have something specific you're looking to educate yourself on, but you know, even with our academies, we go into pretty much a great detail talking about this. You know, the soil microbiome, the relationship between the microbes and the plants. Um, there's some great resources. Uh, Mycorrhizal Planet by Michael Phillips is a great read on that. Uh, Teaming with Microbes, another great book. Uh, you know, you can, you can do a lot of it on your own if you choose to. I think it's just as relevant. Thank you, Shane. Okay, this is going to be the final question, and I'm going to direct it to you, Alan. Anthony asks, how do you move five times in an afternoon at 750,000 pounds per acre stock density? Okay, so if you've got 750,000 pounds stock density, uh, you're moving five times, um, you know, the, the more moves you make in a day, you've got to understand what you're doing, okay? When you go to ultra high stock densities, you're doing that predominantly to build soil much more rapidly and build that microbial population and tap that latent seed bank. Those are the primary things that you're after at those ultra high densities. And therefore, uh, it, it's, you know, that becomes the overriding goal and objective. You can't do that day after day after day and maintain a high level of performance, or, or at least you've got to be very careful in, in doing that. Uh, can you move them five times in an afternoon to take advantage of higher bricks? Well, well yes, you can. Uh, you know, and at an ultra high density, 750,000 pounds, the fact of the matter is, if you're at 750,000 pounds per acre, you're going to be moving them things, you know, every 20 to 30 minutes anyway. Uh, and if you're not, you're, you're going to have way too much impact uh, on a particular paddock. So, so five moves occurs 
in a relatively short period of time in, in, in a three hour time span or so at that stock density, you've moved them five times. Uh, and, and of course you can do all of that easily in an afternoon, starting at noon, something like that and take advantage of the higher bricks as well. Uh, Gabe, I do want to just very briefly go back to the question about the, the Marsh Elder and the Sarisa, uh, because sure. I'm intimately familiar with those. Uh, one thing about the Sarisa to remember, it produces a lot of tannins, and those tannins are natural dewormers, okay? So one of the big benefits of Sarisa is, is as your livestock eat it, uh, they will naturally deworm themselves. Uh, secondly, on the Marsh Elder, Marsh Elder in particular, uh, is going to grow when you have, uh, it, it, it's an opportunistic plant, okay? And, and it likes a wet footprint as well. Uh, so if you have areas that are grazed down too tight, when it's warm and moist, uh, it, and you, you don't have a lot of competition from grasses and things like that, so you've basically got areas that, that are sort of devoid of a lot of other growth, that marsh elder is gonna really explode, okay? Uh, so it's a factor of, now you can go in and you can, you can really hammer that under higher density and totally reverse that situation with that marsh elder. Very good, Alan. We'd like to thank everyone for joining us here today. Just to let you know, uh, Thursday, April 9th, we will be holding another webinar at 7.30 p.m. Central Time in which we will discuss the tables have turned. We'll talk about the current pandemic and the ramifications that we feel it is having on both society and production agriculture. On Tuesday, April 14th, the webinar will be Marketing Laying the Foundation. Shane New, Alan Williams, and myself will discuss the aspects of different marketing strategies in order to capture more dollars. On Thursday, April 16th, we'll be holding a webinar, Soil Building Secrets, in which Ray Archuleta and David Kleinschmidt will give tips on soil health and making the most of your nutrient needs during this upcoming planting season. As Ellen stated, if anyone has a particular topic that you would like to see us discuss on a webinar, we plan on keeping, uh, we plan to keep doing these webina webinars for the foreseeable future. So please get a hold of Kathy. Thanks everyone on behalf of Understanding Ag, the partners and the consultants, we want to thank you for joining us today. Everyone, please stay safe. Thank you.